Hi, welcome to the second of five videos dealing with the statistical concept of regression. Uh, if you missed the first one, uh, we discussed the very basics of regression. So we looked at sums of squares, so all those SST, SSE, and SSR type terms. Uh, we looked at the error terms and also touched on R squared. So if any of those things seem confusing for you, maybe have a look on the Z Statistics YouTube profile and you'll be able to find the first regression video. But in this one, um, we're going to look further at R squared and in particular, have a look at something called the adjusted R squared. And we're also going to be dealing with the very pesky notion of degrees of freedom, um, which is the thorn in pretty much every student's side when it comes to statistics. So uh, hopefully I'll be able to give you a real intuitive way of looking at degrees of freedom. So let's recap and take uh, the definition of R squared given from the previous video, which is SSR on SST, um, or alternatively, the proportion of variation in Y being explained by the variation in X. Now, a quick note, um, SSR in this equation is specifically the sum of squares due to the regression. So this is, this is what I'm using throughout all of these videos. SSR is the sum of squares due to the regression. SSE is the sum of squares due to error. Um, now, a couple of people had uh, some questions off the previous video about the correctness of having SSR, what shouldn't it be SSE or and vice versa. Um, there are alternate definitions for SSR and SSE, alternate like letters. So just be very careful when you're using SSR and SSE as acronyms. Be careful what the R and E stand for respectively, because an alternate way of doing it is to say the explained sum of squares, which is ESS, which is the same as SSR. Anyway, I don't want to get you confused. So I'm going to just go back to this. Um, and this is what I'm going to be using throughout the entire, entirety of the video. So just be aware that that's what I'm doing. So we have R squared equals SSR on SST. Now, what does R squared actually represent? Here we have four unique scatter plots. So each of these represents some kind of, you know, study. And we have five observations in each of these studies. And as you can see, if we start from the top left, all of the observations line up in a very neat line. You've got your y-axis, your x-axis, and you can see that you've got all of these points lining up really nicely. So, as we said in the previous video, a regression is essentially drawing a line of best fit through all of the observations. So if we look at the top left, you can see that the line of best fit goes through every single observation, which is not necessarily very realistic in practice. But if that's the case, then we say it has an R squared of 1. Now, the further away the observations travel from that line of best fit, the lower that R squared is. So, as you can see, for each of these, and I've just drawn these myself to make it clear what an R squared represents. But as R squared decreases, you can see that the actual relationship is becoming weaker. So, X is explaining less of Y as we go across and then down these little panels. Also keep in mind R squared varies between 0 and 1. 1 is where we have a perfect linear relationship, so that's our top left example. And 0, if you have an R squared of 0, that's where we have absolutely no relationship at all. Um, so it should look like a random scatter of points. So not, not even this one on the bottom right has an R squared of 0. And in fact, you're very rarely going to get something that close to 0. You're never going to get 0 in practice even the most unrelated variables are going to find some kind of relationship, be it weak or otherwise. Okay, so let's have a look at the concept of degrees of freedom. Now, as I said, I think I'm going to give this a very intuitive flavor, so hopefully you can run with me here. The way I'm going to start the explanation of degrees of freedom is, is by looking at a simple linear regression with one dependent variable. So one independent variable, that's our x variable here, and one dependent variable, y. Now, I guess I'm going to ask you, what's the minimum number of observations required to estimate this regression? So let's just say Y is, say, a person's uh, height, for example, and we're going to try to estimate a person's height via their weight. So you'd expect that someone who's, who weighs more might be taller, but it's not obviously going to be a one-to-one -one relationship. There's going to be some error associated with it. But how many people do you need in this study to make a regression? So here we have X and Y. Now, if you think you have one observation, so one person in the study, you can't run a regression. You can't draw a line of best fit through one point. 
I think everyone can appreciate that. You can draw a line in any direction you want through that one point. So you might think, all right, well, we need two observations for our regression. And you might think, okay, that's good. We can draw a line of best fit through those two points. But appreciate that it doesn't matter where that second point goes, if it's over there or if it's up here, we're always going to get an R squared of 1. What that means is that line of best fit is always going to go through both of those points. And given that the R squared is always going to be 1, the strength of the relationship between Y and X just can't be assessed. So it's not really a regression at all. And it's only when we get that third observation that the model gains some freedom to assess the strength of the relationship between X and Y. That line can actually go in between those three points now. And you can see that our R squared, it's not 1. Here we have an R squared of 0.87. And the idea is we have one degree of freedom because we have that third observation which allows the model to actually differ from the points itself. Okay, does that sort of make sense? So if we throw another observation in the mix there, we actually have now two degrees of freedom because there's two additional observations allowing this model, giving this model a bit more power. Now, here's the real kicker, and this is what I think gets people across the line to appreciate how degrees of freedom interacts with the number of variables you have in a model. In this case, I've thrown in a second variable. So let's just say Y was our you know, height again, X1 is our weight of a particular person, X2 is perhaps someone's mother's height. So that's the person's mother's height, for example. In this case, what's the minimum number of observations required to estimate this regression. Visually, we can say it's represented by a sort of three-dimensional space. We have x1 on the horizontal axis here, x2 on this kind of axis coming out of the page, if you will, and then y is going up. So, what's the minimum number of observations you need to run a regression? Now, let's just start with three. Now, unlike the two-dimensional equivalent, here we actually are, draw are drawing a plane of best fit. When you have two x variables, essentially what you're doing is putting a plane through those points and appreciate that any three points in three-dimensional space can have a plane cut through all three of them. So here we have an R squared of one, but when we introduce that fourth point, that plane actually gets some freedom now to cut through those four points meaning we have degrees of freedom of one in this case. So in the three-dimensional example we have here, we needed that fourth observation to get one degree of freedom. And if we had five observations, we'll have two degrees of freedom, etc. So with that additional variable x2, we've actually lost some degrees of freedom for a given number of observations, which leads us to this particular formula, degrees of freedom equals n minus k minus 1, where n is the number of observations you have, k is the number of explanatory or x variables. So you can see as k increases for a given n, we're going to lower the number of degrees of freedom. So in this case, for the single x variable example, we had four observations and two degrees of freedom, because if you think about it, we have n is 4, k is 1, we only have one x variable, so n minus k minus 1, 4 minus 1 minus 1 is 2. Now if we throw in the third variable, well, the second independent variable, and we have four observations, 1, 2, 3, 4, we only have one degree of freedom in this case. The addition of that extra variable x2 has lost us a degree of freedom. Okay, so why do we care about degrees of freedom at all? What does it actually do for us? Well, as we'll see, degrees of freedom is actually closely related to R squared. And R squared is quite useful, don't forget, because it tells us how much of the variation in Y is explained by X. It's that measure of that strength of the relationship between X and Y. And that's affected by degrees of freedom. How does degrees of freedom relate to R squared? Well, as the degrees of freedom decreases, for example, you're adding more and more variables to your model, R squared will only increase 
And that means that if you're throwing in useless variables into your model, it doesn't matter how useless they are or how little they affect your Y variable, R squared is going to go up. Not because you're adding any more explanatory power to your model, but because you're reducing the degrees of freedom. So to summarize all of that, we know that R squared can be quite deceiving when you have low numbers of degrees of freedom. So what can we do about that? Here's a metric called adjusted R squared, which has a fairly complicated formula. But if you have a look at the top one here, if you have the original R squared, all it is, it's a case of plugging the numbers in here. You can see you've got your N there, which is the number of observations you have. K is the number of variables. And as K increases, you'll see that the adjusted R squared actually decreases when you hold everything else constant. So what the adjusted R squared is effectively doing is accounting for the reduced power in the model when you have a low number of degrees of freedom. So here I've written as K increases, adjusted R squared will tend to decrease, holding everything else constant. Obviously, if you're adding very useful variables to the model, adjusted R squared will also increase. But if you're adding useless variables, you'll find your adjusted R squared decreases to reflect the fact that you've lost degrees of freedom. So to finish off, let's have a quick look at this very hypothetical situation where we have 25 observations for these first four models, let's say, and we have four variables in the first model, five, six, and seven variables in each respective model after that. You can see I've kept that the same for the, these four models down here as well, but for these four we have 10 observations, so 10 people in the study. Now the R squared, again I've just made these up completely, 0 0.71, 76, 78, 79, you'd be thinking, great, every time we've included a new variable, the R squared's increased. This is great. Let's put more variables in because our model keeps getting better and better. But if we have a look at the adjusted R squared, you can see that there's, okay, there's a, a sizable jump here when we've gone from four to five. And indeed the adjusted R squared increases as well. And again, it increases the next time. Not by that much though. And once we get to seven variables, even though the, uh, the R squared has increased, the adjusted R squared actually decreases using that formula on the previous slide. So this kind of indicates that we actually had the best situation when we had six variables, not seven. Um, and you can see that when we have a few, only very few observations with respect to the number of variables, the effect is even greater. So with the same R squared situation here, you can see that the adjusted R squared decreases considerably. So 0 0.0550 seems very, very low. And why that's the case is that we only have two degrees of freedom in this very last regression. Remember, it's n minus k minus 1, which is not much at all. That's not, a, that's not a very healthy regression. You need quite a few degrees of freedom to actually be able to explain anything, to, get, to allow the model to have error in it, to see whether the two or three or four variables are related to each other. Final point to note about adjusted R squared is that it's not bounded by 0 and 1. It can actually go into negative. So it's, it's not really an intuitive value. You can't sort of say that this is sort of 0.05 of something. It's not 5% of anything. But it does give us a way of actually comparing between models. So in this case, you'd say, well, oh, this one looks like the best model where we had four variables. And out of the top four, we might select this one as the one that has the best, the best model in terms of explanatory power. So that's it. I hope you've enjoyed the, the explanation of degrees of freedom and R squared for this, the second of hopefully five videos on regression. I'm Justin Zeltzer and this is Z Statistics.